Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us, first of all, for what is sure to be a, an interesting look into the future of esports. And I, I guess if you look at the, the name of our panel today, it's, we're looking at the potential of esports uh, to understand what is possible in the future in terms of what the ceiling of, of this movement, of, of this industry might be. Um, I want to first just go back a little bit and, and talk about how it's grown to this point. So, so each of you, from your own point of view, uh, you know, how do you think esports has got to this point? Well, you know, we're, uh, we have a particular lens because we make the, you know, the kind of the, the cleats and the helmet that, uh, that an esports athlete uses. So we, we make the mouse and the keyboard and the headset. And uh, for us, you know, esports started way back in the late 90s when the first uh, games like Quake started to really pick up steam. And in the early days of esports were really minor things. And we started to see people start to use our, our equipment with such, uh, such frequency and high repetition rates that they were breaking earlier. So we had to build you know, higher durability and faster uh, switches. And then as it's gone through over the last four or five, six, seven years, about six or seven years ago, I started five years ago, we started to see esports really take off. And, uh, and then we started developing products with, with esports athletes. And you know, I'll, I'll just echo what, the, what as Rob said. Yeah. You know, we're at the very, very beginning of this esports development. Uh, so you're obviously coming at it more from a, a hardware point of view and a, and a commercial point of view. Uh, Andy, yours is, your background is it's more in uh, originally playing the games yeah. um, and then developing an empire uh, from there. So, so how do you kind of think it's come about for you? Yeah, so I think that esports really started to take off uh, as content uh, became more accessible to gamers, right? And so it really took off when Twitch started to explode and live streaming for gaming really started to grow. And as that started to grow, it made esports spectating just a lot easier in general. And when publishers started to notice that, uh, that, that that was a niche that was growing, that gamers were actually interested in uh, gaming content, then they started to work on their spectator, uh, which enhanced the experience for uh, users to consume their content. And so um, I, I think eSports started to really pick off within the last five years. Uh, you know, gaming is one of the biggest verticals on YouTube uh, and Twitch and even like on the web. So uh, that, from my experience, I, I would probably say uh, within the, the last five years or so. When we're, when we're looking at eSports athletes, assuming we can call them athletes, um, the, the prize money and stuff now means that it is a, it's a considerable thing to be doing. You know, you can, you can really make an incredibly nice living out of these things. Do you think for, for eSports to take the next step, um, there's going to have to be some sort of uh, regulation of, of the sports more? And also, do you think, you know, what, are, what is going to happen to the athletes, that are the guys that are playing eSports in terms of the commercialization of them? They already have agents. They already have uh, deals with, with suppliers. But what will be the next thing that goes with them to make it even more of a professional enterprise? Yeah, so as you see eSports progress, right, there, there are now player unions, players are collaborating, team owners are collaborating with publishers. And I, I really think the next step is uh, for three of those parties to really work together to build a strong and entertaining league. Because as you see eSports develop, uh, media rights for those leagues are also increasingly, increasingly growing, right? And so uh, a as those grow, uh, bigger advertisers are starting to spend more and more on media rights. And uh, I, I think it, it's, it's going to take time for sure, because from a monetization standpoint, esports is still far behind uh, from traditional sports per user. So if you look at like the NFL, the NBA, uh, they're monetizing probably 20 to 30 times more per user than esports. And uh, I think within the next five to 10 years, it's going to catch up pretty quickly. So for you, you must see the numbers. You, you're working in a company that is has really got involved, originally just you know, like a computer hardware company, you've seen the opportunity within gaming and esports um, and really gone down that, that pathway. You, you sponsor teams in, in numerous territories. But what are the actual numbers behind it that really sucked you guys in? Well, you know, I'll just get, I'll throw out a few numbers that's, that some people in this audience might, might be surprised by. You know, this week, last weekend, I was at the League of Legends final in Beijing. And in that final that championship, there were 70,000 people who watched it live. At the same weekend at BlitzCon in LA, uh, I don't know how many people watched that live, but I'd guess it was about 20 or 30,000. So 100,000 people watched a live e-sports e event that weekend. 
live or in person. Another 100 million watched those two events live, streamed somewhere in the world. And that's, that, would have been, that was a little low for League of Legends because both teams in the final were Korean. And the original, the original thought was one would, be, one would be Chinese, but they lost in the semifinals. So that's 100 million. That's bigger than uh, the 100 million in that range is now, this, this eSports uh, viewership is now bigger than uh, any event except Formula One, Super Bowl, World Cup. You know, this, it's, it's the fourth largest viewed uh, eSports or sporting event now in the world. And it's so early, and a lot of the people in this audience probably don't even realize it's even close to those levels. So you can imagine there's a cohort there that is super interested in this. And that cohort is super interested in a lot of things, including what we do. So we're, we, we got into this because the numbers were really big from a, a cohort perspective, that young audience, and they're also really big for us in sales. So we sell a lot of esports equipment. So if we, we subscribe to what Andy was saying, that basically this could be monetized perhaps 20 to 30 times more going forward. If they can improve the, the commercial aspect of, of esports, what, I mean, what size of industry are we going to be looking at? You know, I don't, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be terrified to give a number because I don't even know. I know for our business, our uh, gaming business, remember, we operate just like Nike would. You know, we, we, develop, we develop our products with people like Andy and with Andy uh, for, for, for the professional athlete. But then we've, we develop a range of products that works all the way down to the person who plays, you know, who, the 15-year-old boy who's learning how to play the game. So that whole thing for us has gone up, uh, I think we've grown 50% in the last three years, three and a half, more than that, probably 110% in the last three and a half years. So if you think about that, today we have a $310 million business and we're little Logitech. Somebody, you announced this is a big company, we're tiny. But you can imagine that with the numbers we're talking about now, we're, it's really attracting the big players. And for someone like you, Andy, you, you came into this uh, blogging, writing guides uh, and walkthroughs for, uh, for League of Legends and stuff. So that has progressed into uh, a larger website initially, and then you now have content going out on multiple streams. You have uh, people that work for you, you've got a big team and everything. So bearing in mind the growth that you've seen personally from just a little one-man band and to, to a, a huge thing, uh, you know, the largest esports team in, in, the Ameri uh, in America, right? Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. Uh, with, with those lessons in mind, where do you see the next step for, for you guys personally, but also what does that mean for the wider esports industry? You know, are they going to be huge, huge multi-million dollar teams and, and a lot of them, perhaps? Yeah, so uh, from, a, from a growth perspective, I think within the next five years, we're probably going to see the esports industry as a whole probably uh, exceed a billion dollars in revenue. And, uh, you know, for us, right, we're, we're starting to make major investments into establishing a facility for our players that, you know, ca that can fit 50 players and uh, close to 100 in staff. Um, I think within the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot of these leagues uh, become much more prominent. You're going to see regionalization um, where teams are based in specific cities. And uh, it, it's similar. It's going to be similar to traditional sports where you grow up and your, your dad or your mom, whoever, takes you to a baseball game, a football game, but except it's going to be eSports. And right now, we're still in the first generation of gaming where uh, the millennials are, are playing the game, they're watching the game, they're going to these events. And within the last five years, what I've noticed is that our fans, they're starting to have kids, and they're taking their kids to our events. And that, that's one of the probably the most rewarding things ever. It's like seeing a little kid or a baby in a, in a TSM outfit, right? And uh, 10 years in the future, what I'm going to see is those kids, they're going to grow up and they're going to go to our gaming events with their, their parents and maybe even their, their kids, uh, their granddaughters, right? So I think eSports is going to be a lot more interesting within the next 10 years just solely due to the purpose of having two generations now watching your sport versus one. So you say you're, you want to build a facility for, you, for your team. So do you really see kind of, uh, there could be something here where you're, providing all these things for your, for your teammates? And, and are we talking nutrition? Are we talking, obviously the equipment is supplied already, but you know, you're, you're basically putting these guys in the best possible position to succeed as a sports team would in terms of like massage, physiotherapy and, and hydrotherapy, all these things. Is, is that gonna be a thing in esports going forward? So I, I think that's gonna take time, but definitely what we're planning to do is we're gonna have full-time trainers on, on site to really work with the players in terms of their health. Um, we're going to have sports psychologists there. We're going to have coaches there. Uh, so 
really anything you can think of, even chefs, right? So I think most esports teams nowadays, they have like full-time chefs that cook uh, really like nutrition meals for our players. So uh, and anything you really see in traditional sports, I think a lot of the things that actually work will be adopted over to esports as well. Do, do you think, is, is it fair to say, because obviously esports appeals mainly to a certain demographic, which is uh, males between, say, let's say 12 and 25, but broader eventually. Do you think the fact that uh, it only or mainly appeals to that demographic is a weakness? Do you think esports has to make efforts to broaden its appeal? Or do you think that that's actually a strength, that it really targets one demographic of society? I, I think it's a huge strength. I mean, I, you know, by the way, just to correct you, about a third of the gamers and uh, of what we consider gamers are, are women or girls. So it's not just a guy's sport. And the, and, the, and the rate of growth in girls is higher than the rate of growth in boys. So it's, it's growing faster. Um, the second thing is, you know, here's an interesting fact. So first of all, I think it's a big strength because it means that a huge percentage of this cohort is interested in the sport. And this cohort, this age group, is going to grow up. And as they grow up, they're going to keep being interested in the sport. You know, right now, more people are watching, um, more people, are watching people play games online. Not playing, but watching people play games online that are watching ESPN, Netflix, uh, uh, Showtime, CNN, all combined every month. And that's just this cohort, as you said, it's really developed with you know, kind of Andy's age and down. So you can imagine as they grow up and the next cohort also joins the party, how big this will be. And, and obviously what that brings with it is brands that are gonna want to be associated with, with the sport. How can esports teams like yourselves better monetize large brands, mainstream brands, like, for example, Coca-Cola and, and these companies, in attaching themselves and understanding esports? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think it's already a case of some of the biggest brands in the world uh, that already work with us, right? So, for a good example is Logitech already works with us, Gillette works with us, Red Bull works with us. So, really, uh, pretty much all the biggest brands in the world already work with us, and I think uh, the reason why they do work with us is because they're, they're tying their, their products to performance, right? So with the Logitech specifically, they, uh, every single year and pretty often, they would send their engineer te engineering team to our facility or to our office, and we would work with them directly on their product, and they would develop products that fit perfectly for our gamers' needs. Uh, a good example is also Red Bull. We actually live right next to their facility, and uh, we go there quite often to work with their trainers, uh, to work with their psychologists to help us uh, improve our performance. Uh, and even, even, even Gillette, right? Um, you know, so they're really involved with us uh, within a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. It's no longer a case of us actually waiting for these advertisers to come. They're already here. And how they got involved was with their experiential budget. And now what you're seeing is that we're moving into their sports marketing budget, which is, um, which is huge. And so I, I think it's just going to take time for those budgets to grow. But uh, you know those mainstream advertisers are already there. But presumably, uh, sorry. Well, I just add, you know, if you if you want a little more evidence, it, here's not the how, but here's some evidence that's going to happen. Is if you look at who's buying in. So Andy's bought into the League of Legends total team now. They had spent ten million dollars to buy their way in for the future. The game's resetting. The whole league is resetting. So now ten million dollars in, he's in here full time. Who else is in? The owners of, of the NFL teams are coming in. The owners of the NBA teams are coming in. The owners, so that these, these are the, the organizations that know how to monetize and get the big brands in. And, and Andy's learning like crazy, so I, wouldn't, I would say he, he's one of them. So I think it, there's a lot to say. This is going to be a big brand sport over time. Uh, and presumably then as well, you're looking at it as they're investing sums at the moment and they must be seeing a return to continue to be interested with the growth that we know is already happening at a fast rate and will continue to happen at a fast rate. They will get bigger returns and they'll realize that it's, it's worthy of bigger investments. What does, that mean for, what does that mean for Logitech going forward? You know, I think we're, if you think about it, what we, what we, the role we play in this, in this sport is we provide the equipment for the athlete. Yeah. And we've been providing that same equipment for everybody in this audience for the last 36 years. So we've heavily invested in building an understanding of how to build better mice, better keyboards, better headsets. So I think in that space, we certainly have competitors, and they're very good. But I doubt if anybody new will come in and decide they want to become an, a, an equipment uh, provider for these athletes. They may, but, but it's unlikely to be a really large company. Um, so I like, our, I like our position in this. Do we think that the rise in, in mobile gaming will, uh, will change the market slightly? Do you think it's going to 
uh, like how will that affect you personally? Yeah, I think it will. And I think, uh, I think the advantage of mobile gaming is you no longer have to stop playing the game. You can get up and go, and you can keep playing it. Now, I think just like um, with PCs, when phones became more and more uh, heavily uh, computerized and, and loaded, you know, a lot of people said, well, the PC is surely going to go away over the next 10 years, starting back in 2005. Today, people use PCs for productivity at exactly the same rate as they did in 2008, 2007. And why is that? It's because all the phone usage is on top. And I think with mobile gaming, you're going to see the same thing. People are going to play and are playing more and more mobile games, but it's going to come on top of the, of the PC gaming that they're playing here. And from the team point of view, Andy, the mobile gaming revolution, do you think that is going to continue to the point where we're going to see a, a difference in the competitive environment? Um, I, I think that there's going to be a market for both, right? And uh, mobile is definitely something that we're going to focus on too and we already do focus on. And I mean, if, if, if you look around nowadays, pretty much any kid, anyone that's growing up, they're on their tablets since age three or four, whether it be a puzzle game or practically any game, right? So it's going to be a very important market for us to, to uh, attack in the future. And it's something that we're focusing on. I think it's going to be a major market. I mean, one of the biggest things about gaming and esports is that the barrier of entry is so little. You can be of any age. You can be really like of any age. You can be of any gender. There's no physical barrier to be a competitive gamer. There, there are kids that are 14 or 13 or 12 even playing um, competitive mobile esports, right? And there are people that are 35 or 36 that are still competing uh, in esports at the highest level. And that's, that's really, truly what's most interesting about esports to me. Uh, I also feel like they're, you know, we're supposed to be addressing how this relates to traditional sports. Now, if you think about with the kind of advances in technology, everyone has uh, a smartphone. Everyone has computers these days. It's very easy to be a gamer from a young age. At a time when also we're seeing some of the traditional sports like American football, where fewer and fewer kids are playing it for safety reasons or, or whatever. So do you feel like uh, esports have an opportunity because of, you know, it's fundamentally it is a safe sport because it, it's not... Uh, a testing physical pursuit in the same way that some of these other ones are, but you're not going to have any of the potential pitfalls that we're seeing in American football with concussions and other sports with other industries and, and steroid problems, whereas this is eSports where anyone can play, and that openness means that the, the potential for growth is actually much, much bigger than the traditional sports, even though they're huge billion-dollar revenue industries, you know? You know, I think the, uh, one of the wonderful, one of the, one of the reasons why this story has happened is because everybody has a computer, you know, and so, and you can play by yourself. And so uh, gaming, be, gaming developed uh, obviously way ahead of esports. And so I think gaming in general, where everybody in this audience plays some kind of game in their life. And, uh, and it's, it, I guess in a way it's not surprising that those games eventually develop and get more sophisticated and become, you know, esports. And I think, the, this is probably the safest game you can play in some ways, there are th but there are downsides to every game. And, and I think you know, there, are, there are people who play this game too much and, and, and get, uh, you know, some would say, addicted to it. Yeah, yeah. There are, you, can, you can develop you know, carpal tunnel syndrome for things if you use a, a, a keyboard or a mouse the wrong way too much. So it, it does pay, for example, to, to have the right equipment. <laughs> but uh, uh, you'd expect me to say that. But, but I think you're right. I mean, it's a super safe game. You know, in fact, in, in, your, in different parts of Europe now, there are places in Sweden, for example, where you can drop your kids off on a Friday night at 5 o'clock. They lock the doors from the outside. They can get out from them. And, uh, and they can leave their kids overnight. And it's like a slumber party, but it's a gaming slumber party. And, and in a competitive sense, obviously, that, that's going to increase. We know that because more people can play these games than ever, that's going to keep going and keep going. But... You're obviously competing at the high end. You know, uh, lots of people will play, but they will also be always be at a social level, whereas you're more at the elite performance end of things. So, globally, how do you think that picture is going to look in, in five years in terms of the elite gaming competitions, the esports competitions? Um, it, it's it's really hard to tell where where it's going to head exactly in five years. But what we know is that more people are playing games than ever, right? And what people do is they 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 like what they understand. So it, it's really important uh, for gaming and esports to get to the point where it is a fun uh, social event that any spectator can go and understand to watch, where you can have a good time with your friends, your family. 
Uh, and I, I think that that's really where the trajectory is headed, is you're starting to see um, you know, teams compete in these massive stadiums like the Staples Center, the Madison Square Garden, uh, and even in the stadium in Beijing where there's like a 60,000 person audience. And um, what, what these publishers and what we want to do is we want to make it really entertaining for the, the spectators to just come enjoy the match, understand the competitiveness of it, but also have a good time. I, I think that's where it's headed. I think it's going to um, be more socially accepted as time goes on. And it, it's really going to be a, a generational thing where you can you know, take your friends or family to just have a good time. You say that you think it's going to be more socially accepted. Uh, do you feel like it, it isn't socially accepted at the moment? I think it's definitely uh, more and more socially accepted as years go on. Right? If you look five or six years back, the stereotypical, like the stereotype, is that gamers they play in basements, they're nerds, they have no social skills. Now you look at it uh, as mobile exploded. You see, I mean, my grandma plays Candy Crush, man, yeah. <laughs> and our, whether it be Clash of Clans, Clash Royale, I'm sure everyone here in this audience has, has played a, a mobile game, right? And so I, I do think that every single year moving forward. Uh, it, it is becoming more and more socially accepted. And if, if it's something that's mainstream that everyone understands, then it'll evolve much faster. And uh, like you say, you know, this, if the stereotype is playing in their basement, and we talk about the events last weekend where you've got 100,000 people in person to see <laughs> it, it sounds like a pretty big basement, uh, <laughs> let alone the 100 million people watching online. And uh, I think you're, you're talking about the social acceptance. We've got to look at it now as, as because this isn't on, this is not on the mainstream television networks, but that isn't actually important because of the way that you can broadcast via Twitch, via YouTube. You know, the internet has done many things. A lot of it is cut, just cutting out the middleman. And, and now that there is almost unchecked possible growth with the fact that you can all broadcast to whoever you want, um, it's hard to conclude that esports can't be, you know, how on earth can they be stopped from growing? Whereas the traditional sports are, are slowing down. So with reference to the, the, the name of the panel, you know, will esports overtake traditional sports within five years? Just some final thoughts from, from each of you as to if you think that's possible. Yeah, I would say, um, so first of all, if you look at the, uh, you know, I'm 54. If you look at my kids who are 25 and under, it's already blown away, traditional sports. I mean, traditional sports are interesting to them, but in terms of the attention that esports get, they're dwarfed. So the, the, the battle's already over under 25. The real question is what's going to happen above 25? And is it in five years, will enough people be that those 25 year olds will go to 30? You know, Andy will be 30. And there'll be another five years with the kids in there. Is that going to be enough to, to be a lot bigger than traditional sports? Probably not. But you're going to see, but that's going to happen over the next 10 or 15 years. I'm sure of it. And Andy, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, so I, I don't think it is a five year horizon, but I think it's a 15 to 20 year horizon, right? Um, what, what I want to see is our existing fans to have kids, and that's when esports is going to grow, and, uh, exponentially grow. And then, as those kids have kids, that's where it's going to be the sweet spot, wh sweet spot where three generations are now following our sport. So it's definitely going to take time for advertisers to catch up. It's going to take time for our fandom to grow. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight, but give it 15 years, um, I, I think it could. Thank you so much, both of you, for your insight today, for your time. Uh, thank you all for coming to watch. Hopefully, uh, you. uh, you've learned something or just been entertained for 25 minutes or so. So uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Nicely done.